pleasure to host Prof Paul Kearney, who's come to speak to us today on an issue that's close to many of our hearts, which is why the policymakers seem to ignore your evidence, or our evidence. And uh, Paul is Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University of Stirling. And I got to know Paul's work a bit through uh, getting involved in policy evaluations in the Caribbean, and realising I was a real novice at this, public health person who's written lots of policy recommendations in my time, and had them ignored, of course. Uh, one of the books I found really useful for that was Paul's book on understanding public policy. And his most recent book is The Politics of Evidence-Based Policymaking, which is very appropriate. So thanks very much indeed, Paul, for making the trip to come and see us today and to give this talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I normally like to start a talk with an apology. <laughs> and this time it's, uh, I've, I've got a slight cold, so... I think the choice is my voice giving up halfway through or me sucking on a, lo a lozenge while I give a talk. <laughs> None of you have any preferences. I've gone for the lozenge. Just let me know. Uh, this, um, with the, the title, I'm really playing to the audience, I think. I'm trying to, you know, make you feel good. But, you know, I think that's, lots of people have, have asked themselves this question. Uh, but I should say, with with my background uh, in your politics, an un undergrad in politics, and postgrad in politics, then happily going along with my career in politics, I don't I don't remember the word evidence really coming up at all, <laughs> and until quite recently, and it's only in the past couple of years I've you know talked about nothing nothing else because it seems like uh lots of people in lots of disciplines are interested in that question about uh evidence and i guess a lot of that has to do with um our need now to demonstrate impact with research evidence but i think uh you know um, disciplines like uh public health you know there, w there was this um question you know always came up with it when i did things like you know tobacco research this was always a question about you know we know we know that what the problem is. We have the evidence of the problem. We have all these uh, studies of evidence on solutions. You know, so why aren't policymakers doing anything about them? And I think that's a kind of classic question. So the only problem is, uh, so I, if 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 you read the abstract, this is this is pretty much pared down the abstract, and it, and it doesn't quite work as a presentation. I, I found when I was trying to do the presentation, but <laughs> but essentially you can see the three aims. So. My first aim is to explain 60 years of policy studies in about two minutes. Okay, so I mean, I think you've got to uh, be, um, be kind to me there. The second is to identify these conditions under which evidence will win the day. And of course, that's a trick because, you know, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but evidence never wins the day. That's, just, that's where that leads to. And then identify the dilemmas that arise we try and maximise the use of scientific evidence and policy. So when I when I give uh, when I give the same kind of talk to uh, social scientists or political scientists, I have to remember that I'm doing so because the first thing they'll say to me at the end of it is, um, you know, that was very interesting and all, but why are you so obsessed with scientific evidence? You know, there are many other uh, competing knowledge claims. You know, so why privilege this one? Uh, but I think for this audience we can privilege scientific evidence. That's not controversial. Okay, so this is a, a sort of better structure would be three reasons. We'll start with three reasons why policymakers seem to ignore your evidence and indeed my evidence. I should say, virtually no policymaker li listens to me. Okay, so I can't, it's not a, it's not a blueprint for us. There's no solution at the end of this. Or like I can say, you know, like a, it's a group therapy. So, and self-publicity, of course. Now, I should say, I'd like you to appreciate, uh, if my university asks, I uh, would like you to feedback that I use the appropriate branding. Be <laughs> <laughs> the difference, that's our motto. Be the difference. <laughs> Uh, and if this comes up, this is quite good, this comes up in another slide. So, and, okay, so I'll, I'll punt some of my work as well. 
the best way actually about producing one of these short books is you get to choose the, the wallpaper. See that? I mean, <laughs> classic look. Okay, so the first reason is uh, policy makers different ideas about what counts as good evidence. Okay, so oh, actually, it, I, f I find that this is quite interesting. When I gave a guest lecture to some social policy undergrads recently, I, I just asked them, you know, go into your groups and tell me what is evidence, you know, and they came up with pretty much what I think uh, I would de describe as what policymakers would pay attention to. So it's, um, they didn't actually mention scientific evidence, it was mostly, you know, um, social attitudes, practitioner experience, service user feedback, and so on. You know, there are so many forms of information into government. I think I think that's what policymakers would more likely describe. They receive many signals or many sources of information and many different claims to, to action. And so the, the sort of input of scientific evidence is just one of many inputs into that process. Uh, so I think that's a nice simple explanation. It's not it's not a, an uplifting explanation, but it's uh, it's a simple one. And the other one is there are many policymakers across many levels and types of government. So I think often we think of, as a shorthand, policymakers are, you know, government ministers, for example, or ministers and civil servants. But really, in, in most policy processes, you're talking about lots of different levels of government, each with some level of authority. And I think the, the nice example that one of my colleagues uh, wrote about recently was um, on alcohol control in Scotland. So lots of... Um, people with a public health background had convinced the Scottish government that alcohol control was a good idea and that they should, you know, they should, they should do more than lots of other governments. But then what they found was when they tried to see this through at a local level with licensing boards, uh, those policymakers had very different ideas and they had the autonomy to reject that agenda. So they were actually back at uh, square one. You know, they, they, they thought that they if they, if they won the argument once, then everything else would fall into place. But actually they found they had to win the argument in many different venues at different times. Okay, so, essentially, there are many competing knowledge claims and there are many people who will have to be persuaded that your knowledge claim is more important than anyone else's. Okay. So you could probably stop there. I mean, that's probably... I was just going for the, the quick and concise. You could stop there. Uh, but the second is, I like this, you know, policymakers have to ignore virtually everything. And I like this, this great phrase in, in another study on uh, punctuated equilibrium, which sums up politics <laughs> along the lines of, you know, uh, politics is about almost everyone knowing almost nothing about almost everything or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and it's necessarily so, you know, because the... The world, the available evidence is infinite, and our, our ability to process it is, is, is finite, I think, unless anyone, there's no exceptions. Yeah, so, essentially, uh, the world is full of people who know virtually nothing and have to ignore virtually everything. Now, I think in, in policy studies, the classic term for that is they're not comprehensively rational, they're, they're boundedly rational. And in... in but the key thing is, they also have to act despite their lack of knowledge. So you say they, they actually they, they produce two shortcuts to action. One is, these are provocative terms. One is rational, so they set goals and they work out what's the best source of information I can find in the time I have to process information. I mean, just out of interest, what would... I'm, I'm going for audience participation now. <laughs> don't, we, don't we too worried? But what would be examples of you know the best sources of information just so I can engage the room? Google. What was that? Google. Google. Oh, yeah. Okay. If we were going, if we were going more sincere, what would it be? Cochrane and Campbell libraries. Okay, right, okay, so that's, uh, I, th I thought we'd maybe just go up to Google Scholar, but no, you've really, got, <laughs> you've really gone for it. <laughs> okay, so, so some people might, <laughs> yeah, so some people might go straight to a sort of a notional hierarchy of evidence uh, at which certain forms of method-driven evidence are at the top, and I think 
uh, things like Cochrane sum up, you know, the, the gold standard is the systematic review of the randomized control trial. Is that, is it, okay, so I like that. It, it, it's actually, I mean, one thing to note is uh, that level of agreement on that gold standard is, this is, um, this is quite a moment for me because most, <laughs> most of the time I give this talk, people just don't, you know, most audiences will not recognize that standard. They won't, they, they think, what? Well, you know, the students I was talking about, they, they wouldn't even have heard of these sources. Uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, know about or care about that hierarchy. Okay, so. So maybe under those circumstances, you think, well, if they don't go to these libraries, I don't, not, I don't think many elected policymakers are going to the major databases to check the latest uh, RCTs. So um, but you might, do you think maybe they'll, maybe they'll go to experts instead? But then that's a whole, I think in this hierarchy, expertise is, is quite low, isn't it? Is it somewhere in the shaky middle, somewhere above practitioner experience, that sort of thing? Okay. But then, possibly more importantly, they use so-called irrational methods to make very quick decisions. So uh, you, can, you can decide the nature of a problem and the most appropriate solution uh, almost instantaneously if you use your gut or you just go by habit or your deeply held beliefs. Okay, so these, these would be the two ways in which uh, policymakers, as with most people, uh, work out how to ignore almost everything to make choices. Okay. Now the third one is a bit trickier. This is um, they they don't even control the policy process. So um, this is you have to bear with me. This this could take. This is actually a whole uh, forty credit module I deliver <laughs> on a slide. Okay, so. What can we do? I think the, the classic uh, representation of policy making is summed up by this policy cycle in which, you can't even quite read it, but you say, uh, imagine a sensible process for making policies. You would identify a problem. You would, um, oh, okay, no, let's do it with evidence. Identify a problem using the best evidence. Uh, produce <coughs> Sweet options of the most evidence-based solutions. Uh, make a choice and legitimise that choice. Attach resources, implement, evaluate, and then make a decision about if you should continue. It's a kind of classic cycle idea of a decision. Now, um, some things have changed. This is interesting to me. You can just humour me for a second, but. It used to be only policy scholars uh, would say, you know, this is this is a a simplification of reality that bears no relation to reality. So when I bring this up in teaching, it's to show what doesn't happen. A bit like comprehensive rationality, you know, we we'll say, okay, what happens when this doesn't hold? Now, it used to be that governments would pretend that the cycle did happen. And this is what I found interesting quite recently. The European Commission for a long time used to publish a policy cycle to say this is how we make policy through these stages. But now they're much more likely to give you this. Now the cycle is in there somewhere, but it's hidden with all these squiggly lines. I don't know what that says to you. Anyone we did so well the lat the first time? What does that <laughs> what does that say to you? Complicated, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, to me, it just said it's a big mess. That's what they're trying to say. Okay, our policy process is this big mess. Um, I thought that was that's quite an admission. I mean, I think it's an honest account of. I mean, it's not an accurate one, but because you know, <coughs> those lines don't actually relate to anything. But it's an it's an honest account of this process is so messy that we we don't quite understand it ourselves. Now. Uh, there are lots of policy concepts and theories used to try and conceptualise and simplify that process. <coughs> now, this is this is my favourite just now because we see if you if you 
if you attach this space picture to our university's <laughs> brand name, I really, I think I'm onto something here. <laughs> that. Really we don't have a space program at Sterling, but you know, if we did, this would be the one. So, but this is an analogy associated with, I think, one of the more popular theories to have taken off outside of political science, multiple streams analysis. I don't know if anyone is familiar with multiple streams. Uh, now, if you are, I'll, I'll be a bit boring here, but if you are, there's a choice to be made about which metaphor you use to describe multiple streams. And you're probably thinking, well, streams, that must be water. It's, it's more than one watery stream. Okay? But if you look into this, it's much more like the metaphor of a space launch. Because what essentially they say is, there are these stages, you know, people do identify, or they, they, they interpret problems in a particular way. They have, at some point, feasible solutions. At some point, policymakers have the motive and opportunity to select them. But those three things come together in a very unpredictable manner during what they call windows of opportunity. Now, I think that's akin to a space launch because what, what, what Kingdon and colleagues would suggest is that these three things have to come together at the same time for, for policy change to happen. If, if something, if one of those three elements does not, is not quite right, then it all just essentially gets called off. So that's why I like the spaceship metaphor, you know, because, I mean, I don't really know much about space, but um, I know one of, them, one of the elements is the weather. You know, the, if the weather's not right, they call it off. Or if all their buttons are not on, they call it off. Right, so all these three <laughs> things things. Right, it's, it's like in a health audience, isn't it? I don't have to. <laughs> uh, okay, but they all have to come together. And that's a very different image. It's a sort of, partly an image of serendipity, but partly to emphasise the importance of the nature of the environment of policy that's out, out of the control of individuals which is the sort of almost the opposite of the cycle image which suggests that you know a small group of powerful people are smoothing out their decisions through this cycle. Uh, then another interesting one is um, <coughs> excuse me, associated with punctuated equilibrium theory and in a nutshell now, I think you have to just go along with this, because this is a lot of um, work that I'm summarising in, in a minute. They essentially, they say, this is, the, this is the, a notional normal distribution of all policy change over 50 years. And in this case, it's budgets. And they say, if, if, you, if you measure all policy change, it does not uh, follow a normal distribution. Instead, what you have is, so there's the, there's, there's the zero point. So, they say almost all policy change is virtually zero or minimal. So there's a huge number of small changes, and then there's a small number of huge changes. You know, they say this characterizes the policy process. It's not a kind of continuous incremental process. It's a hyper-incremental process punctuated by massive changes. And then finally, uh, if you want something nice and simple, so I think I think the cycle, part of the reason why people like some of these models is that's it's quite a comforting image of this, and so it looks quite <laughs> simple. So I knocked up an equally comforting one on my my Word, Microsoft Word, and it essentially has the you know the rational and irrational choice in the middle, and it has these concepts that sum up the environment. You know, so you essentially say, to account for the policy environment, you pay attention to the formal and informal rules that people follow within organizations, the networks that are formed between policymakers and influencers, uh, policymaking context, the role of um, foreseen and unforeseen events, the distribution of policymakers and influencers across many levels and types of government, and a tendency for certain ideas to dominate, dominate discussion or for, for deeply held beliefs 
to dominate uh, certain parts of government. So I guess uh, if I wasn't in a kind of health, public health audience, I would say there are these public health people and they're obsessed with RCTs and hierarchies of evidence and that's the that's almost the language they use to speak with each other and if you don't speak that language uh, you won't you won't influence that group of people and um, you you find a small part of government that's, that's similar you know that has the same ideas and those ideas can be taken for granted you know and you can communicate uh, you know using that kind of language and pretends that there is no outside world in which people use a different language. Now, <coughs> unfortunately, you can find those kinds of paradigms or you know, uh, commonly shared beliefs in lots of different government departments, a lot, lots of different areas, but they're very different beliefs. So I guess you know, the classic would be if you try to form relationships with people in the Treasury, the language would be more about something like you know, value for money, or something like that, instead of um, hierarchy of evidence. And um, okay, so I mean, the the point would be, any policymaker trying to do something here would have to engage with all of these things. And I've just said in a few previous slides, they don't actually have the ability to pay attention to much, and they wouldn't understand it if they did pay attention to it. Okay, so. Under those conditions, how does evidence win the day? Well, you can see where I'm going there. I have to meet these three conditions. So, this is a kind of multiple streams -y type explanation. The first condition is, so I'm, so I'm trying to imagine yourself as the hero here with, with evidence. The first thing you've done is you've, you've taken scientific evidence and you've used it to persuade policymakers to pay attention to a problem and shift their understanding of it. Now, the classic example in countries like the UK would be tobacco control. You know, um, tobacco in in the UK government was for a long time seen as an economically advantageous product, primarily. You know, there are many ways in which to think about tobacco, but for decades in the UK government, it was seen as uh, an economic good. And a, and a legal product for people to use. Now, I, I would say, and you can argue with this if you want, it's primarily seen as a, as, a, as a contributor to a public health epidemic and something to be, a problem to be solved. And, and there's a real uh, major difference in the policy that, that comes out of those two different understandings. So, scientific evidence definitely helped or the use of evidence definitely helped reframe this uh, image of tobacco within government. Although it took, um, I don't know, anyone do tobacco? It took, I would say, 60. 60. Oh, okay, I was going to go for 30, but okay, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. I know, I know what I'm doing. Okay, it took a hellish amount of time. And it's, it's, it's probably uh, safe to say that, you know, we're, we're now encouraged to think of uh, research impact as an almost instantaneous event. You produce, you publish an article, you see a policymaker the next day, and then they do something about it. Okay, and this is this is more like it. This is decades long action. The second requirement: the policy environment has to be conducive to policy change. Now, again, this relates to all these things here. So, to cut some of this short. Essentially, you have to have the right organisation in charge, so that they can, so that their rules matter more than another organisation's rules. So it used to be that the um, the Treasury or the Department of Trade and Industry was in charge of tobacco policy in the UK. So of course, their rules were about um, raising revenue, encouraging production, encouraging manufacturing, and such like. When primarily the responsibility <coughs> would shift to the health department. Their rules were much more about um, the other thing. So <laughs> slip, slip for a second there. But the um, about consulting primarily with health and public health interests, excluding tobacco companies, 
and seeking solutions to an epidemic. Uh, so the same thing, you know, networks eventually became conducive to tobacco control when they would exclude tobacco companies and uh, include uh, public health people, and so on. You know, so the, I could go on, but the a lot of the stuff I've done on, on comparative global tobacco is to say that these conducive environments can be found in a small number of countries and not in others. Okay, so uh, scientific evidence will only sort of win the day in the countries in which there's an environment in which you know those ideas will spread. And then finally, uh, as a you know a hero with evidence, you're exploiting these individual windows of opportunity for policy changes. And I think in something like tobacco, you could say there are maybe a dozen policy instruments that would change to produce something that you would say is a comprehensive tobacco control scheme, or six if you want to you know, bunch them together. Um, and in many cases, these had to be you know, fought over each time. You know, each policy instrument required a, a different political debate. Okay. Uh, now I've just got this sense I've not got much more time. So, if we had more time, I would say the 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 um, the, the opposite case is something like prevention or early early intervention policy, where it's much more difficult to go down this list and find that these conditions are met. Uh, you know, mostly because it's difficult to know what prevention and early intervention are or what people make sense of them. Okay, but uh, I can. Speak about that more if you if you like later. Okay, so uh, I suppose I gave that away when I said I've no answers to these problems. But um, how could you encourage such outcomes? You know, beneficial uh, e evidence-based outcomes. Uh, well, I think the 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 thing that I've written about that people find most interesting. I'm not saying this is necessarily makes it the best, but it's, you know, we all respond to feedback, don't we? So it's this distinction between uncertainty and ambiguity. So a lot of people produce scientific evidence to reduce uncertainty. And I mean, you're the exception, of course, but lots of scientists think that the solution to uh, you know, policy, you know, lack of policymaker attention is to produce more evidence, you know, if they're not uh, bowled over with the evidence we've got, let's give them more. More reports. Uh, and then recently you know, people have said, well, how about we try it with shorter reports? You know, but it's still, it's still about reducing uncertainty with evidence. When really politics is, a, is about the exercise of power to reduce ambiguity, which is there are many ways to understand the same policy problem. And politics is about... Uh, getting policymakers to pay attention to one understanding at the expense of the rest. And I think that's where uh, people focus their time to generate the demand for evidence. You know, so instead of focusing on the supply of scientific evidence, they focus on generating the demand. If you can get a policymaker to think of a problem in a particular way, then they'll ask for evidence to, to do something about it. Okay. Okay, and there were lots of other things there, but it was it's all variations on the same theme. I think we can skip over that. So, how should you do it? Is it a different matter? Um, so, I was involved in a sort of a trial course on you know researchers becoming more impacty, and of course I would present that sort of thing. And you would say, well, the things I would have to do to become influential, they seem so fundamental or so time intensive that there would have to be more than one of me or would need a team or something like that. Or, or most of these skills do not come from researchers. They come from other people, other organizations. So one, one response could be to do nothing, to simply produce evidence and then think, right, the rest is beyond me. I think I respect that position. Um, the second point, these are all things to put you off, I guess. Uh, there are many models of good governance. So, I mean, again, when I, when I have different audiences who say, you know, the idea of evidence-based policymaker or evidence-informed policymaking is one of many 
types of good policy making. Another source of good policy making would be you know consensus driven you know a, a process in which you gather together many people's opinions and, and try and bring them to a consensus. And that need not be primarily evidence informed. It can be belief driven. And this is my favourite one, there are many models for encouraging evidence use across the whole of the public sector or government. Uh, and I'm going to show you some examples in a table with text too small to read. <laughs> oh no, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Where did they go? Ah, uh, there. Yeah. Uh, so, here it is. Good luck with this one. But essentially, this is one for further reading here. There are I would describe three different ways in which you could use evidence to spread you know, best practice in a, in a particular area. Okay. Now, I think probably the one you like the look of most is this one, which is you gather the best evidence from RCTs and systematic review, and you tend to come with a, a requirement of fidelity you know, to roll out a program and to, to know that you're implementing the same program each time and that you can evaluate it in the same way each time. It has to be a, a, a model, it's a uniform model with high fidelity rolled out across the whole country. Uh, I mean, I suppose to cut a long story short, I would say uh, in most policy areas uh, in most parts of the UK, that is the least used model of evidence-based best practice uh, compared to things like um, you know, variants of an improvement methods or improvement science or variations of storytelling in which a lot of policy change comes from speaking to service users and adapting uh, programs to their feedback rather than evidence from RCTs. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what you would make of that. That's, I'm, just, I'm just saying that that's the case. There's no real punchline to that one. I mean, another one is, um, this is quite interesting, from the, the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission. So they've come up with a wheel. I couldn't tell you why it's a wheel, but it's eight skills uh, for better evidence-informed policies. Now, I suppose the punchline to this one is, um, can you see, only one of those skills is doing research, <laughs> and it's synthesizing research, it's not producing new research. So eight skills for knowledge management for policy, seven of them are of nothing really to do with evidence at all. Okay. Uh, I don't know, make of that what you will. I've got another paper about that, but, you know, I've not, I've not got time for that. Okay. okay, so, I mean, the punchline, I guess, would be, we started off with this question, why do policymakers seem to ignore your evidence? Now I think if you then think about how the policy process works, identify the conditions under which evidence will really make an impact, and then identify the dilemmas that come up when you're trying to maximise the use of evidence. I'm not sure you would finish with that question. You know, it's, I only ask this question with this kind of audience. <laughs> Okay, so that's nothing else for now. Okay.